The strange story of Andy and Lele, the cannibalistic, murderous siblings, begins after leaving their captivity from the apartment complex where they were abandoned by their parents. The whole reason for their imprisonment was passed as an elaborate plan for quarantine after a mysterious contagious deadly disease. However, according to their investigation, the apartment complex contained many people in the apartments with their blood type information written on their doors having detailed information about each cat. Each individual was treated differently based on how universal their blood type was. The ones who were widely donors were treated much better compared to the counterpart who were even deprived of necessities such as food, hygiene products, and much more. Therefore, it seems as if the building contained his subjects whom they wanted to harvest organs from. The duo managed to escape their imprisonment, killing some people on their way, getting on the local bus and going to the nearest town, which reveals there is no contagious pandemic which requires any quarantine and the people in the apartment complex were simply keeping them captive to run experiments and harvest their organs. Being in a cheap motel room, left with pennies to their name, not knowing how they will manage surviving in this large new world, Ashley goes on her taunting and tormenting room routine yet again on Andrew, calling him Andy over and over again, which triggers him. Ashley yet again has her weird lip-biting, too-close-for-comfort, touchy-feely approach with her brother Andrew, which is at best questionable and at worst, well. They tune into the TV to see if they hear anything about the building that they just escaped from, which reports on the quarantined building being burnt which confuses them, dismissing it as a blessing, something that would destroy any evidence of them running away and killing. However, this deepens the story that maybe the government is in on it as well, funding these buildings which harvest organs at best, if not something much more sinister. And it turns out that they are destroying any evidence of them committing such heinous crimes by burning the entire place down. As it seems, they are lying to the public that it indeed is a building facilitating support to the patients who have contracted the mysterious disease. While sleeping, Ashley has a dream which acts as a premonition that someone will break in and kill them. She takes Andrew out of the motel and they wait outside, waiting to see if the premonition would indeed come true. Waiting outside for a while, they see a hooded man passing them, not being the same person Ashley saw in her vision, which instead reminds them of the demon summoning neighbor that they consumed in the first chapter. Andrew carefully and quietly goes after the cultist, infiltrating the summoning in the building, where he notices what amateurs they truly are, not cut out for this type of ritual, with them wanting to experience something thrilling, being part of the cult more for the coffee and free cakes than anything else. Seeing nothing interesting, Andrew leaves to get back to Ashley. Andrew catching up to Ashley explains the cultist club were amateurs and couldn't summon anything and Ashley explains no one showed up on her side either. Just when she is disappointed and wanting to head back, they see a mysterious black car pull up, being the same person from her vision there to kill them. It turns out the piece of item that the demon gave Ashley in the first chapter did in fact give her the ability of seeing the future through visions to save their lives. Going to their room, Ashley contemplates on who this mysterious person is, who clearly is there after them, tracking them to kill them. Could it be possible he is from the organization that trapped him in the building, the powerful organization that controls even the media? Ashley, being a psychotic mastermind, explains in detail what they should do in order to fend themselves off and kill the perpetrator, as no matter what, even if they escape, they will come after them until they are dead. The plan is to go to the motel and lure the killer out, who is possibly hiding in the closet as he wants to do a quick and quiet job without raising any unwanted attention. In the motel room, they would pretend that they're going out for a snack, going through through the local park. In there, they would hide somewhere and ambush the hitman, killing him with the gun that they took from a guard that they killed in the building that they were quarantined in. Just then, everything going to plan, the hitman also hides somewhere in the park, seemingly knowing what the plan is. Just then, Ashley, being the criminal mastermind that she is, commands Andrew like a puppet to take the gun and claim the hitman's life himself. 
She then pretends as if she's fooling around with Andrew, running into another bush, distracting and tricking the hitman that they are hiding, not because they know that there's a hitman, but because they are fooling around. Using this tactic, Andrew uses the gun on him and kills him. They leave the corpse of the hitman behind, taking his car keys, getting in the car with an envelope confirming that he was hired to kill Ashley and Andrew. Not contemplating on who is after them too much, they plan to pay their parents a visit and rob them, stealing as much money as they can to live off it for the time being. Ashley is still resentful for them being abandoned by their parents, she even plans on killing them, especially as she has a dark heart and showed what a menace without remorse she truly is. In episode number one. Andrew disagrees, only wanting to get some money from them, breaking in when they aren't home. After getting annoyed at Andrew for whatever reason, she falls asleep, awakening in the demon's realm, the demon that she called upon and summoned in episode number one. The demon indicates that the trinket that it gave Ashley to see the future has run out of energy and every time she uses it, it needs to be recharged. For that, she needs to offer a new human soul to the demon in return. She considers giving the souls of her parents to the demon, thinking what Andrew might think of it, when the demon disappears with Ashley awakening in her own reality. Andrew seems quite worried, having Ashley sleeping on his lap, saying how he was about to take her to the hospital, as it's been a while. He low-key apologizes, seeming like he enjoys the attention that he's getting from Ashley as well, into the twisted, unorthodox, questionable sibling relationship that they have. Parking in a local park for free, they walk the rest of the way, arriving in the new neighborhood of their parents that they recently moved into. Despite the mother telling Ashley to never call again, she told Andrew over the phone when they still communicated that they are in a new neighborhood, with Andrew still remembering, managing to track the place down. Finding out which house it is becomes really easy, as they even have nameplates on the doors. They go to the garden, seeing how large and beautiful the house truly is, especially as to how they would afford something like this. Entering the house and looking for cash and jewelry, they find a document from three months ago being death certificates of Ashley and Andrew Graves, way before the supposed fire burning the building. This is despite Ashley calling a few weeks before with the mother telling her off not to call anymore, which depicts the parents were probably in on it too, selling their children to this evil organization and hence why they received such high compensation buying this property a few months ago. Just then, they hear the main door open with none other than their mother coming in. Although Ashley is cautious and untrusting of their parents, Andrew like a little child rushes towards the mother, happy that she's home and that they can finally see her, expecting to be embraced by her. The mother, on the other hand, is less than accommodating, surprised that she's seeing her son home, unhappy that he's here, interrogating him why he's here. He simply explains that he's happy to see her and that the door was open, hence why they came in, wanting to visit their parents. Although she asks about the quarantine, he dismisses her question by offering her coffee. She then says that she wants to wash her face, with Ashley asking Andrew what he's doing, to which he replies that he's acting and he's not so stupid not realizing that the parents had a hand in their pretentious quarantine. Sitting at the dining table, drinking some coffee, Andrew lies that as there was a fire, they clearly Andrew and Ashley as they didn't have any parasites. The mother is cut off guard, clear that she had a hand in their wrong imprisonment. She then deflects a question about how they afforded this house, with their conversation continuing on for a while. That's when she says that the father is arriving soon and she should get going to make some food, her way of telling them to leave. But of course, Andrew, wanting to get to the bottom of it all, says that she can rest as he will make food as he wants to see the father as well. The mother still pretending, lets out a big sigh, being annoyed, not wanting their twisted misdeeds be revealed letting Andrew cook. While cooking with the mother gone, Ashley explains to Andrew that she needs souls to re-energize her trinket, to which Andrew says that he needs to think about it, whether they want the parents to die. After some time, the father also arrives, not looking very happy to see his children. Soon after finishing dinner, not even paying attention to what Andrew and Ashley say, the father says that he's exhausted and needs to wake up early, not at all one bit happy that his children are alive and here to 
see them. The mother follows him, ordering the children to clean up, leaving them behind. Andrew and Ashley then discuss killing the parents, to which Andrew refuses, saying that they cannot do that, especially as it would directly put them as prime suspects. Even though officially they have been declared dead, the organization knows the truth fully, especially as they sent a hitman to finish the job. That's when the mother quietly comes to the kitchen, observing Andrew having his hand in Ashley's back pocket, being inappropriately touchy-feely, when she explains that they need to leave the place as they are already in their 20s, but they can't stay for a night, being too generous to them. It appears she knows about Andrew and Ashley's inappropriate supposed relationship as well, ordering them to sleep separately and find different places when they leave the house. So Andrew goes on to sleep on the couch, and Ashley goes on to sleep in the basement. The mother shouts orders at them to go to bed right now or she would kick them out when they have no other option but to go to sleep. In his dreams, Andrew is hunted by the memories of the cultist neighbor that they consumed in the apartment complex that they were in, alongside other past memories. In there, he has vivid memories of his ex-girlfriend Julia, who told him in a very polite and nice manner, maybe it's better for Ashley to get her own independence as Andrew keeps on cancelling and leaving early just to be with his sister Ashley. Of course, this is a nice way to ask his relationship with Ashley as inappropriate and she should have her own life rather than clinging onto Andrew. Seeing how he killed the ward, the woman in the building and the hitman, he has no regrets as they were all bad and caused danger. He did all that to defend himself and Ashley. But there remains one person who died innocently. That person is Nina, who Ashley, in a menacing way, ordered and manipulated Andrew to lock in a chest in a dusty place, who died after being locked there for hours on end, suffocating a child whom they killed when they were kids themselves. And all that because Ashley was jealous of Nina liking her brother Andrew. In this twisted memory, Ashley and Andrew bury the small corpse of Nina in the woods, with Ashley gaslighting Andrew that she will tell on him if he finds any other other friends and if he doesn't do what she wants. That he is a bad person and no one will like him, so he only has hair now and no one else, as no one will like a bad person like he is. Her insecurity and possessiveness is too damn toxic, willing to go to such lengths to possess Andrew. And his happiness and well-being doesn't really matter to her that much, as if he doesn't belong to her, she is not happy. Therefore, it is not true love, as she wants to possess him and enjoys tormenting and gaslighting him, having an extremely toxic relationship. As as if she has this frustrated tension to him, drawn to him physically, but yet knowing the morbid aspect of it, yet trying to be inappropriate in a teasing and taunting manner, dismissing her actions as such. Andy knowing what a horrible person his sister is, yet loving care, saying that he has a rotting, moldy spot in his heart for her, depicting what toxic relationship they have, always addressing each other by what they truly are both fully knowing that they are horrible people. With Andy being played like a puppet, they make a blood oath for Ashley to keep their secret that they killed Nina, while Andrew promises that he will always be in her company. She even admits that she wants them all to herself with no one ever being in his life, to which he disagrees, saying there will be others but she would be his priority. Hence why, even with Julia, he made his sister his priority, always leaving early and cancelling on her. That's when he is awakened by Ashley, whispering in his ear to kill their parents. Yet again, unsurprisingly at this point, Ashley jumps all over Andrew being inappropriate, but of course Andrew doesn't seem to mind too much. But something within him clearly indicates that he knows something like this is wrong, always teasingly insulting her when she gets too close. Meanwhile, while Andrew agrees that the parents should die as the mother would surely snitch on them and expose their location, and he knows they were involved in their imprisonment. From the stairs, the mother comes down, not seeing Ashley, knowing Andrew would be sleeping on the couch. She starts explaining that she feels bad and owes him an explanation, but without Ashley. Trying to say something about a situation with Ashley and him, when she notices Ashley holding Andrew when she comes down, seemingly knowing that they had a weird past. 
hoping it is not what it seems like when Ashley all of a sudden points the gun at her, ordering her to go down to the basement and Andrew to grab the ropes. It seems as if the mother actually likes Andrew and wanted to discuss something with him. There being more to the story and why the parents made the decision to have them imprisoned in the quarantine building. Something about Ashley being twisted and sick. She seems to dislike Ashley as she is quite despicable. Andrew goes up looking for rope when the father awakens, but he tricks him to go down when he finds some rope and puts a cleaver knife against his throat, tying both him and the mother to a post. Taking their credit card and the pen coat, Andrew goes out to check that the coat works. Meanwhile, Ashley prepares the ritual to sacrifice her parents. She explains that she needs to draw some blood from them so that they won't scream. That's when the mother explains that she knew when they killed and buried Nina, but she didn't say anything to anyone to protect them, and she is not a bad mother after all. But knowing she and the father put them in the building a few months ago to die, she doesn't want to listen to anything anymore, getting some blood to draw the circle for the sacrifice. Andrew gets back, confirming the card works when Ashley summons the demon and offers the souls, which leads to the parents dying. To ensure that they are dead, Ashley stabs them and the duo decide to get rid of the evidence by reducing their corpses into parts and dumping them somewhere. They soon take the parts and place them in the fireplace to burn them. Meanwhile, having a taste for human flesh, Ashley takes some of their parts and cooks them into a soup to enjoy them, having a twisted sense of justice and empowerment that eating humans gives her some higher meaning that she consumes their memories and livelihood. After being left with some bones and the skulls, Andrew removes the teeth to prevent them being identified and they head to bed so Ashley can have another premonition to see if they are in any danger before leaving. In her dream, she sees a cold and silent Andrew kicking open the door behind Ashley as if he's intending to kill her. Andrew holding a cleaver knife grabs and drags Ashley by the hair, saying how tired of her nonsense he is killing her. She awakens, considering if this was a premonition and if he would actually kill her when Andrew gets to her, asking if she had a vision to which she denies. They then take the remains of the deceased parents and go to the ocean and chuck them far into it. They have their normal arguments and disagreements while having a lot of tension between them, getting into the car, driving far away into another location, running away from the authorities and the organization that imprisoned them, having a lot of cash in hand, with Ashley unsure if Andrew will eventually kill her or not, as her manipulations and severe toxic possessiveness almost drives him into the edge of breaking. So it's very clear now, consuming human flesh for Ashley has become a power trip and something that she enjoys and tries to justify through her usual nonsense. Andrew, on the other hand, acts like a whiny puppet who enjoys the tension between them. And the parents, despite clearly being condemnable for giving away their children to the evil organization to die in, they knew the twisted eeriness of them and how they killed an innocent child, Nina. To top it all off, Ashley and Andrew seem to be having a demon on their side now who constantly requires human souls so they would need to keep on killing. There are several more endings to the story which I will explain in an upcoming video, so make sure to stay tuned by hitting on the subscribe button and the notification bell. It's been your host Star, and I will see you on the next one. Have a fantastic day folks. <laughs>